Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are powerful to rule and you're powerful to speak. Please speak by your word to us this morning. Please change our hearts that we would hear you and that we would live in obedience and faith to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been following the adventures of Daniel, a Jew in exile. Daniel was taken from his home as a boy and he was carted off to Babylon. And over six chapters, we've reviewed the big events of his life. Not his birth, his graduation, marriage, birth of his children, none of those sorts of things. No, we've been following the events that established that God was with him, that God was still on the throne of history, and that God was still walking with his people, even in their suffering and defeat. And one of the things that's been striking about Daniel is that he's a really calm head in a crisis. We've often contrasted Daniel calmly trusting God with the various kings and wise men losing their cool all around him. I actually said a few weeks ago that that's the difference between trusting in your own resources and resting in the arms of a powerful God. But in this chapter, we see a very different response from Daniel. In this chapter, we find it's Daniel freaked out by his dreams, Daniel having trouble sleeping, Daniel looking for his dreams to be interpreted. And we're going to see that Daniel was right to be disturbed, but that what he saw ultimately offers us fantastic reassurance. Now, slightly disorienting for us, this chapter takes place before chapters 5 and 12, some 12 years before the end of Belshazzar's reign. So what's going on? Well, you'll remember the early chapters of Daniel are arranged in a sort of mirrored pattern. And chapters 4 and 5 are a matched pair in which God humbles proud kings. Uh, chapters 3 and 6 are a matched pair in which God rescues his people. And now we come to chapter 7, which is matched with chapter 2. And both chapters feature scary dreams from God, which lay out the future. In chapter 2, it was the pagan king who saw frightening visions from God. But here it's Daniel. And Daniel too looks for an explanation, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. And again, the explanation points to the future kingdoms. But crucially for us, Daniel sees more than the pagan king did. He sees not just earthly kings, but into the heavenly court too. And we're going to break it down into three sections, and I've labelled the first one, another frightful dream. Daniel had a dream so frightening that he got up and he wrote it all down. And he tells us that this is what he saw. Have a look with me at verse 2. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and fill your flesh Eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Phew! Take a deep breath, Daniel. There's more, but we're just going to consider this section for now. And it's a wild dream, full of vivid images, crazy creatures, and, and surprising developments. I try and imagine dreaming this yourself. How bizarre, how terrifying. What is going on? Firstly, there's the wind, then the sea, then these horrific Frankenstein's monster creatures coming up out of the sea. Who are these beasts? And how do they kind of be so powerful, so violent? And who's giving them permission to rule, telling them to eat their fill of flesh? Daniel is reeling from visual overload. These composite beasts are like hyper real and, and terrifying. And the action is frenetic, isn't it? Raging seas, violent winds, beastly creatures emerging from the sea and setting off to wreak havoc. <laughs> and it's all too much. And the thing is, they just keep coming one after the other. What is going on? Whatever it is, this can't be good, surely. That's Daniel's reaction. Verse 15, he says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. See, even after it's all been explained, it's still frightening. Daniel's still overwhelmed by the end of the verse, the end of the chapter. Look at verse 28. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Daniel was deeply troubled. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? So what's it all about? Well, Daniel looks around for an interpreter, 
And that takes us to our second point, a frightening reality. Well, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel doesn't have to wait long, doesn't have to make any threats or promises to get his explanation. He simply asks someone who's standing in the heavenly court who explains it for him very succinctly. Let's read it from verse 17 and 18. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Well, you'll remember in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of a statue with four parts representing four different kingdoms, Babylon and three that would follow. Daniel's dream presents the same reality, but now the kingdoms are wild beasts. And that's telling, isn't it? Then, then they were parts of a statue, like an idol. That's because we we're being taught they were grasping after the glory and position that belongs to God alone. They aimed for the stars. They wanted to be gods. <laughs> but look how far sh short they've fallen. They're not more than men, they're less. They're powerful and frightening, but so are the wild beasts. And that's all these kingdoms are. In chasing after godhood, the kings of the earth have lost humanity and become beasts. And this takes us right back to Genesis 1 to 3. Remember Adam was made in God's image to rule over the beasts of the field? But he ignored God and listened to the snake, one of the beasts, instead. And so the image of God in him was warped and twisted by sin. He became less in the image of God and more in the image of the beasts. And that imagery isn't completely foreign to us, is it? I mean, we love to represent our might in the form of powerful beasts. Doesn't England wear the three lions on the shirt? Wales the dragon? The USA is represented by the mighty eagle and Russia by the bear. And if we'd visited Babylon, we would have found it literally covered in giant lions sprouting eagle's wings. Babylon was famous for its enormous walls, had three banks of walls too high to see the top of, and wide enough at the top to ride two chariots abreast. And all of those walls were covered in images of flying lions. And so were the streets and the royal residence. They were everywhere. Daniel would have recognised the winged lion of his dream as Babylon. And when the beast had its wings removed and stood on two feet and was given the heart of a man, well, he would have remembered Nebuchadnezzar, who was humbled by God, his mind made like an animal, his hair like eagle's feathers, but who was restored to sanity and rule when he looked up and acknowledged God. This first beast clearly represents Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar is the last shred of humanity we see among these beastly kingdoms. The next is even worse, a bloodied bear still finishing off its last victim, told to eat its fill of flesh. And then comes the flying leopard, four wings matched with four heads, so it can attack in every direction at once. And finally, the fourth beast, well, it's too hideous to describe. In the next chapter, we'll find that the second beast is the Medes and the Persians, soon to invade and take over from Belshazzar, as we've been reading in chapters 5 and 6. And they, in turn, will be overtaken by the third beast, the Greeks, under Alexander the Great, who conquered, but who was cut down, leaving his kingdom parceled out into four parts, like those four heads and four wings. And of course, after them would come the Romans, unlike any kingdom before politically and in its crushing military might. And so naturally, the fourth beast captures Daniel's attention. His questions give rise to further explanations in the rest of the chapter, which we just don't have time to go into here. But suffice to say, the beast enjoys longevity, giving rise to a string of ten kings and then to another after them. And this last one, though not perhaps the most significant, he's only a little horn, we read, makes himself the focus of God's wrath by thinking to take on God himself, as we see in verse 25, and by oppressing God's people. To God's people, he will appear all-powerful, and they'll be handed over to him, but only for a while. And while he appears secure, his rule will come to an end, just like Belshazzar's, because God's, Daniel's God is the true God, who raises up kings and who disposes, deposes them. So Daniel's given a vision of reality, which is both shocking and familiar. It's familiar because this is the world we live in, isn't it? This is the world of Hitler, Stalin and Pol Pot, of Vietnam and Watergate, 9-11 and 7-7, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, of Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein, of 24 million abortions in seven months this year alone. This is the world of corrupt human rule, grasping after glory and honour and power so it can use it harshly and selfishly. It's familiar, but it's also shocking because this is God's world, isn't it? And where are God's people in this? Are they in all this? Are God's people caught up in all this? Where's God's justice? Where's his love? Where is his blessing on his people? How can God allow one beastly kingdom after another? When will the blessings be restored to God's people? See, see Daniel will have known the promises that God made for glory to return to Israel after the exile. 
He would have known too how the exile was supposed to only last 70 years. We can read that in Jeremiah 29, and Daniel is going to talk about it in Daniel chapter 9. So what's all this about then? Why is God now saying the end of Babylon just means the start of another beastly kingdom, and then another, and then, and then another? Can you imagine Daniel's disappointment? He has been in Babylon for more than 50 years, patiently doing his time, praying through his windows open towards Jerusalem, and longing for the day when Jerusalem will be restored, and God's honour will shine forth from her again. And 70 years is a long sentence, isn't it? For a long time, you'd try not to think about the number of years to come, would you? I mean, 69 years to go, 68 years to go, 67, that's a wait, isn't it? Best just not to think about it. But when you've done more than 50 years, well, you'd have to be starting to think, I could actually make this, wouldn't you? I mean, it's starting to get close. But then what? It's not 70 years, it's 70 years and then years and, and years and, and years after that. Babylon ends, but the new regime is just another beast and then another and then another. God's people aren't going to go back to earthly paradise. There's no return to the garden, no return to David's kingdom, no putting up walls to keep the beastly world out. This is shocking to Daniel. God's people will live in the world, will suffer with the world and witness to the world. And there will come little horns, kings who specifically target God's people and make them miserable with, with terrible suffering. No wonder Daniel's distraught. The world he sees coming is full of pain and suffering and God's people caught right up there in the middle of it. So this confusion, this disappointment, it's completely understandable. It's also what makes the third point so vital. So here it is. Point three, Daniel also sees the overruling heavenly reality. The overruling heavenly reality. See, as all this is going on, perhaps just at the point when Daniel might have thought it was going to go on like this forever, like there's no hope at all, suddenly there's a jump to a very different type of vision. Look down to verse 9. Would you read it with me? It says there, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. From chaos to sudden calm. From those whirling seas and violent winds, from violent beasts destroying and devouring, suddenly we're in the quiet formality of a royal court. And on the throne is a ruler, one from of old. And he's no beast. He's more than human, not less. He's a king sitting on his throne. But he's not just a man. Look, he, he's dazzling to look at. His throne isn't just a, a slab of marble or a, or a gold and purple contraption. It's a fire. And fire pours out of it like a river. I mean, this is no mere man, this is the Almighty, seated on his throne, still in charge, still ruling, even over all those beasts. And now, as Daniel looks, the throne room becomes a courtroom, and the court's in session, and the books are opened. The evidence is considered. See, God's rule isn't like the beasts. This is no show court. This is orderly, considered, under the rule of law, righteous. And then we're looking back at the little horn again. And he's still blathering on in all his boasting, but then suddenly he's thrown down, tossed into the fire like a weed in the compost, just fuel for the furnace. We're seeing that God's rule is absolute. The beasts have no power to touch him. Their boasts are all empty before him. And now as Daniel looks, here comes a man, and he goes right into the court, and he's granted rule and authority over all peoples for all time. Finally, here is the fulfillment of God's plan from the beginning of creation. This is what Adam was supposed to do. A man ruling over the earth, bringing order, peace, and blessing. And notice verse 14. 
He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. See, we've seen all these elements in Babylon throughout Daniel. The exact same phrases crop up throughout. But this time it's full and legit. This is, man is fully worthy of this authority, glory, and power. Worthy even of our worship. This one, like a son of man, is more than a man. The godlike status earthly kings reach for, clutch at, well, it's his by right. And of course, from where we sit, it's easy to see this is Jesus, isn't it? He even called himself the Son of Man, repeatedly. And when he was on trial before the Jewish elders, he made it clear that this is where he got the title from. In Mark chapter 16, the high priest demands the answer to the question, Are you the Christ? And listen to Jesus' answer, Mark 16. Jesus said, verse 62, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest's answer, blasphemy. How can Jesus, a mere man, claim to come into the clouds of heaven and sit at God's right hand? And on that basis, Jesus was sentenced to death. And he did die. And he doesn't look much like a ruler hanging up on that cross, does he? But on the third day, he showed the power and authority given to him, extended even over death. And he rose to eternal life. And then after 40 days of meeting with his disciples, he was taken up to heaven before them until a cloud hid him from their sight. There he goes, the Son of Man entering into the presence of the Ancient of Days, coming on the clouds of heaven. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 9. The next time we see Jesus in the New Testament is Acts chapter 7. Stephen is about to become the first martyr, and he's given a vision of heaven. And what does he see? He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 7, verse 56, this is what he says. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Later on, John is granted a similar vision, and he wrote it down for us in the book of Revelation. And it's, he starts with the vision of the Son of Man walking in the heavenly court, governing the affairs of his people, now fully revealed as the very likeness of God. Afterwards, you might like to compare Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, with Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Jesus is described in just the same way as the Ancient of Days. So we see what was obscure to Daniel, it becomes clear for us. Jesus is the one, like the Son of Man. And he can rule with full divine power and authority because he is both God and man. What human rulers have consistently failed to do, God now does for us through his Son, Jesus. And so we're at the point where we can ask, what does all this mean for us? Daniel was distressed by what he saw. Should we be distressed too? No, I don't think we need to be. I think this is a word of encouragement. Yes, the world is not as it should be, and beastly rule continues, and we as God's people don't get a free ride. We're not a protected class avoiding all that's wrong. We're right there in the middle of it, caught up in all the beastly kingdoms as they rise and fall throughout the ages. But we already knew that, didn't we? Wherever we look in world history, we see inhumane treatment. And we might think that we live in a relatively just and righteous kingdom, but a second look at history at the moment is showing us that we're not so righteous after all. We have blood on our hands from the way we've treated the nations we invaded slaves we traded and all those things that have gone on. But we should be deeply reassured that God remains on his throne. No matter how beastly, how powerful, how violently opposed to God and his people, no beast is off the leash. No beast is doing whatever they want. They're all under God's control. Even in the dream, these beasts were granted power, granted power, and it can be taken from them too. And our God is the one who raises rulers up and who brings them down again. And he is nothing like the beasts. He rules justly, fairly, rightly. And his perfect kingdom has already begun. It's been started and nothing can stop it coming to completion. And so we should be deeply reassured that God is going to judge all things fairly and rightly. That court that Daniel saw, it will sit. Those wicked men who have brought such pain and suffering will get what they deserve, what they've done. God has been watching. He's got every detail written down in those books that Daniel saw. And he will make sure that justice is done, that everyone will get exactly what they deserve. And best of all, Jesus has already taken what's coming to us. So if we're trusting in him, we can face that day of reckoning with calm confidence. Jesus has taken the punishment already. So where are you at this morning? Are you resting in confident hope because Jesus is yours? 
Or are you still trying to grasp at power in the manner of those beasts? Only one of those two has a future. Daniel tells us here and throughout to put our hope in God, to put our hope in Jesus, that Son of Man, both now and forever. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are powerful, that you are reigning, that you are seated on the throne. We thank you that you've sent your Son to come in our place, to take the punishment that we deserve, and now to reign over us. We thank you that one day this vision will be completely fulfilled and he will be raised up and his rule will be complete and all wickedness and evil will be done away with forever. We pray that you'd help us to understand these things rightly, to put our trust in him and to hang on to him for that last day. And through whatever happens, the rise and fall of nations, help us to keep hanging on to him and keep trusting in him. We ask it in his precious, powerful name. Amen.